Sons of Anarchy out again. Good morning! This is Bill from Curious Cars and today Auto House of Naples on what's probably... Well, I'll get into it in a moment. What I have today is a 1960 Rambler American sedan. Well, it's a coupe, but they called it a Rambler American Super Sedan. Uh, it's by AMC, American Motor Corporation. And the Rambler, it's honestly a terrible name for a car. I mean, really. I mean, the Webster's Dictionary defines rambling as proceeding without a specific goal, purpose, or direction. You're basically directionless. You're like, you know, Dalton the Detailer or something. You're just kind of forest gumping your way through life. And uh, I just don't see how that makes sense as a car name. Now, as the proud owner of a really, you know, tired and shitty 89 American Rambler motorhome, I, I would argue the name makes sense for the RV set. I mean, basically... You're not on some mission. I guess you could be, but for the most part, you hop in your RV and you're just sort of rambling around. That makes sense, but for a car, yeah, it just seems a little bit lazy. But anyway, before I get into that, let me do a quick update. The weather report today is dedicated to Jill in San Diego, uh, who was kind enough to send a lovely note saying that she and her boyfriend do enjoy watching the videos but that she did feel compelled to send me a few tips uh, that might help me out. The first and foremost being uh, to shut up about the weather already. Uh, she said she had to mute the TV when the <laughs> weather... Well, look, okay, you know, it's easy to be annoyed by weather reports when you're in San Diego, which has, like, the most neutral, year-round, kind of lovely weather in the country, as far as I can tell. I mean, it's like 76 in August for a mean temperature. Uh, you know, sorry, Jill, spend one month in a southern Florida August, and we'll see if you like bitching about the weather or not at that point. So uh, here, this one's for you. Uh, so yeah, this morning it's 59. We're kind of enjoying our last cool morning. Uh, but later today, it's inevitably going to be hot and shitty. And the forecast then calls for it to be progressively hotter and shittier uh, pretty much for the next eight months. So enjoy that, Jill. There you go. And I, at first I thought her letter was kind of mean because she said I, I looked like her retarded Jewish uncle in Palm Beach. Uh, but it turned out to be questionable penmanship. And uh, it turned out it was a retired Jewish uncle, which is a little bit better and, you know, really cheered up the overall tone of the letter. So thank you, Jill. I do appreciate the tips. I'll do what I can, and we'll see. Uh, other than the weather, I've got that auction coming up this weekend, the premier auction in Punta Gorda. Uh, I'll put a link to that below. We've got 10 cars running through that thing, and uh, hopefully I'll, you know, recoup enough money to at least keep going for a while. Uh, we've got, uh, if you remember, I was doing that IROC a while back as a project. That's gotten a little bit further ahead, and I may do an update video on that. And thanks to my nephew now, my snowflake nephew, having a spring break, uh, he came back and segregated all the photos from way back during the goat flask giveaway uh, to... Um, to do the reader rides video. So that's now, you know, set up to where I can actually make it. And I'm not promising it, you know, in the next day or two, but it's coming up. We're going to actually have that reader rides video. Uh, so all of that said, let's jump and leap directly into this car. And when I saw this car over at Auto House, it did absolutely nothing for me. I, I mean, I knew Rambler existed. I knew a bit about AMC and Hudson and Nash and all that stuff, but it just, it just didn't blow me away or anything. And so I was there for a little while. I thought about doing a video and then Jay, the sales guy over there, sales manager, very nice guy, finally just twisted my arm. I did a little bit of research on Rambler, found out that it really was quite a meaningful car. 
uh, and uh, I'm now quite happy to be bringing you this thing. And I do have a very nice example of one here. So, um, again, this is a 1960 American, well, sorry, Rambler American Super. Rambler beat its own brand, like, you know, Cadillac or Buick or Renault, uh, built by AMC, but it was not, you know, an AMC branded car. Uh, in fact, AMC was fairly new at the time. Uh, it was freshly minted. Uh, this is a 1960. AMC was born in 1954, and it came about by the joining of the Nash Kelvinator and the uh, Hudson Motor Car Company, which, uh, again, in 54 was the largest corporate merger in U.S. history. So it was a fairly big deal. And uh, there were some arguments over who would run it and, you know, a lot of egos involved. But the biggest one of all, Nash's George Mason, uh, got the nod. And he was running the company for at least a few months until he suddenly died, which really threw a wrench into everything. Uh, and after that, they found Mitt Romney's dad, uh, George Romney, he had started working for Nash at some point, and then, interestingly, he turned down a job at Hudson before that, but uh, he was working for Nash, they promoted him to CEO, and uh, he is credited with bringing the company from having a bunch of losses into making something out of themselves. So most, yeah, you give him credit for that, but not all of it was his doing. As an aside, my now deceased father refused to vote for, Rit um, for Mitt Romney. Wouldn't do it. Uh, because he said the car that George, the dad, sold him in the early 60s was a piece of shit. I'm not making that up. And I thought, well, how would he even know? I mean, if he bought a Rambler in the early 60s, you know, what does George have to do with it? Well, it actually fits the history. Uh, George Romney is considered to be one of the first media-savvy chief executives of his era, and he went on the road to pitch the Rambler and AMC to pretty much any group that would book him. I mean, he was just running around the entire country giving speeches and sales pitches and, you know, here I am, here's the Rambler. Uh, he advertised on TV. Uh, they heavily sponsored Disney TV shows. You have to wonder if they do that today. And uh, his message was pretty much ahead of its time. He said the big three were lazy, wasteful, and they were building what he called dinosaurs. Uh, and that AMC's focus was going to be on smaller, simpler, and that is a terrifying sounding bird. Where the hell is he? I'll keep an eye on that. But anyway, he said that their focus was going to be on smaller, simpler, practical cars that got good gas mileage, uh, and that this was going to be the future. Uh, Ramblers like this were touted for having good fuel economy like 10 or so years before anyone even gave a crap. I mean, gas was like 8 cents a gallon, and uh, here he is pitching fuel economy. So, uh, the funny thing is that it worked. Uh, they ended up selling a shitload of them, and people went nuts for them, and Romney's focus on the whole small car thing, uh, you know, sort of not, it didn't seem right at the time, but somehow it worked out. So he's touted for turning the struggling company around uh, into profitability. But honestly, a deep recession that happened in 1958, the same year this car came out, probably helped a small car cause, particularly with the Rambler being the cheapest new car in America. You could buy the thing for under two grand, at least in the base model. And believe it or not, even though this car has basically nothing in terms so many luxury amenities. It's the upgraded model, the super, uh, but the uh, the base, uh, you know, it just didn't have a damn thing. Uh, but uh, I think the recession helped them. I think, uh, you know, the idea that they built these cars that ended up having a pretty good reputation for being quality made and very inexpensive and simple to maintain uh, definitely got the ball rolling for AMC. And they sold a bunch while the other companies, Ford and Chevy, were losing a shitload of money in the late 50s. I think the only successful product that wasn't a Rambler was the 58 Thunderbird, which was retooled and enlarged from the, you know, iconic 57. They would sold a bunch of those and it was a profitable car for Ford. But otherwise, all their cars were 
like 30 40 percent down everyone was losing money and all of a sudden amc was making money because of their small cars and romney seemed like a genius whether he was or not yeah who knows uh but uh in 1960 amc had garnered almost eight percent of the domestic market they moved into third place and uh they were riding pretty high um and it owes virtually all of that to this car uh the american rambler model uh the, sorry, the Rambler American model, uh, which sold so well that demand actually outpaced production. Uh, they were made in Kenosha, and uh, they just couldn't keep up with the amount of people who wanted them. That also kept the resale value up, which made them attractive to people. And uh, they just sold like hotcakes, so it worked out very, very well. Uh, okay, now look, all that said, and I'm going to start keeping these videos a little briefer. I'm trying to keep them at least in the 30 minutes. The 20s would be great, but I'm aiming for the 30s to have a uh, goal that I can attain. And uh, I'm going to take a break there get my shit together, and then we're going to jump into the exterior of this car. So bear with me one moment. All right, so the sun is coming up. It's, it's going to screw things up because I overslept this morning thanks to daylight savings time. You know, it's fantastic. I... <sighs> Anyway, I'm just going to keep going. So look, in, in classic AMC style, uh, they were always underfunded. They never had enough money to keep things going properly, which is, again, why all these car companies were merging uh, to compete with, you know, the big three. That was the whole point, is uh, they just didn't have the dough independently, and this would make them stronger. Uh, but, uh, you know, it did set off this trend of AMC using ingenuity to sort of keep up and keep their designs fresh and do what they could to keep going. Uh, Dick Teague, he actually came to AMC as chief designer after this car was on the road, I think in 61. Uh, he had a huge role in that, but the trend had already been set, and frankly it might have started with this car. Uh, so in their classic style, uh, and using their slim budget, this car first released in 58 was a retooled version of the Nash Rambler, uh, which was first released in 50, 1950. And by retooled, I mean it was basically the same car, uh, the same wheelbase, the same dimensions. Uh, that car, it had some very attractive, in terms of the fender skirts, front and rear, which we'll get into because how the hell do you put them in the front unless you have way too much air in your wheel wells, but they did, and uh, you know, this car does. But they basically took that 50 Rambler, uh, which was considered to be the first, it's acknowledged to be the first successful modern American compact car. So it was a big deal. And I think the styling of that car uh, was done by uh, Batista Pininfarina, uh, or at least partially, uh, who's an incredible car designer who styled some of the most amazing cars in history. Uh, the, whether or not this is one of them, it's kind of hard to say, but you know, you do see some swoops and curves in there. Uh, I wouldn't call it as beautiful as any other 50s Ferrari, but it, you know, it does have some. It does have some curb appeal, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, so they took that car, that 1950 Nash, they updated it, they cut out wheel wells, they changed a few curves, they reused some stuff, and they made this in 1958. And at first, the car magazine said, how the hell is this going to work? This is an eight-year-old design. Americans are in love with cars changing almost every year, which is what the big three was up to. And uh, that's what Romney was talking about. He said, all of that is wasteful and silly. Uh, you know, he's going to be practical and proper. And uh, that's another way of saying we have to do stuff because we don't have any money. But that's what they did. The bodywork is just... I mean, it's kind of raked and bulbous all at the same time. I rarely see cars that... I mean, it looks... You know, the other car that... Rambler, that uh, American... There I am, stammering. The other car that Rambler uh, was offering at the time was the Nash Metropolitan, which was made uh, in the UK and sold under the Nash name. 
And that thing to me looked a little like a 57 Thunderbird being reflected in kind of a cruel funhouse mirror. Uh, it just looked strange. And this car shares a lot of the design features with that one. It's just that one's much smaller than this small car. That was a tiny, tiny clown car. Uh, this is a somewhat bigger clown car. Uh, but they did share some of the same features. But I mean, it looks to me like you took a 55 Chevy uh, it went on a dirty weekend and had a disgusting sexual tryst uh, with a checker marathon, and this is the stunted offspring that resulted. I mean, I just don't see the beauty in it the way that some others might. I do like the roof line. I do like the window lines. I think those are kind of cool. Uh, it almost looks like the window, like the top is chopped. Uh, it's got a nice low rake top to it, and there is kind of a swooping curve going from the front to the back that's almost appealing. You've got sort of uh, trailing fender wells in the back that look nice, the way they're cut out and swept to the back, uh, squared off in the front a little bit. Um, you know, up front, you've got round headlights. You've got a big chrome bumper with bumper rats. You've got a, a grill that looks like a open mouth in the middle. Um, the Nash Rambler had a hood ornament that was supposed to be some sort of angry woman with her chest pointed downward uh, as she moved forward to, you know, nag people. Uh, this does not have as ornate a hood ornament, but it looks like kind of a shark finny type thing, and it looks good. It's fine. Uh, you got some, you know, lights under there. You've got the American script towards the front of the fender. I think they blew a lot of their wad on the uh, hubcap and trim ring design. I mean, that looks... I do like the big R there. I think that looks cool. And uh, the wheel treatment overall does look pretty neat. Uh, the mirrors are the most overwrought, ridiculous things I've seen. They don't look cheap. I don't understand how it fits in to Romney's economy thing. Uh, they've got these weird four things with aft things behind them, and they're far enough up on the fenders in front of the A-pillars to make at least the left side completely useless. I mean, there's like a two-inch window where you can actually see the mirror to see what's behind you. Uh, so it's a little bit strange, but they are ornate and weird, and they don't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, you do have a little grill intake there at the back at the cowl. You've got the suicide wipers. you got chrome around the windshield, aluminum-ish stainless Ish, ish trim uh, that looks like the trim on a Kelvinator, honestly, refrigerator around the windows. Uh, it's got um, vent windows at the front. It's got very interesting door handles uh, that are kind of cool and, you know, they look kind of neat. Uh, going into the back, there's that sort of, ch this is the part that reminds me of the Checker Marathon back here. Uh, you've got a semblance of tail fins. The Continental kit is ludicrous to me. I mean, again, you're talking about a car that, at least in its cheapest form, was under two grand, was the cheapest car in America, and now you've got this big, giant Continental kit on the back. It's like putting a Rolls-Royce grill on a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, there you see the super script on the back pointing out that this is the upgraded supermodel. Uh, actually, in 1960, they had an even higher model. I, I can't remember if it was called the Custom or what it was, but that thing had all kinds of features and special stuff, like, you know, vanity mirrors. But uh, this one was the upgraded model from 58 and 59, top of the line, best you could get. Uh, more classic AMC stuff. You see the taillights on this thing. Well, they were repurposed from like a 54 Nash. They just flipped them upside down. Uh, you know, so they used the same taillights they already had, turned them upside down and called them new. And uh, that would be, again, the trend for AMC for many, many years. Uh, you can also see, I mean, it's so strange the way it just comes down and just bulbuses out at the uh, at the rocker panel area. It's an odd, odd design. And, you know, it's already got sort of a narrow wheelbase and the body of the car just makes it look that much narrower. I mean, there's like, there's like a foot of room between the wheel well and the way... I've just never... Yeah, anyway. A lot of cars had that in this era, but I've rarely seen one that just stands out so much like it does on this thing. Um, and again, the stunted offspring of the Chevy and the Checker. So uh, I'm just not really in love with the styling. Just can't. Uh, the Continental kit just kills me. So anyway, let's have a look inside the trunk and we'll see how this Continental kit works. I think I'm going to need the keys for this. There should be a little handle back here. 
There it is. So that'll pop down the Continental kit. Let me see if I can find the keys. There's the Rambler logo on the chrome there. I got a whole pile of keys here, but I'm sure one of them will work. I don't know, can I push it? Am I that lucky? No, obviously not. I didn't do this. I have no idea what's in the trunk. It could be anything. And it's and it's not working at all. So, okay, that may not be the trunk. You, you can see I've really put some prep into this one. Oh, God, just bear with me. All right, I'm pausing it. I'll open the trunk. Give me a minute. All right, I got it. It was one of the nine keys the car came with. So back in here, you can see I had a decent-sized trunk, again, for a small car. I do love the cogged uh, uniqueness of those hood hinges. They look pretty expensive, actually. They probably could have knocked some more money off the car if they'd used cheaper ones. Like all old sort of classic collector cars, it comes with a host of parts in the trunk and uh, what looks like a very weak-looking fire extinguisher, so hopefully we don't have a fire. Uh, this was featured in a local magazine, this car. There you see American Saturday Night. Uh, this is one of Naples' typical magazines. I'm going to see if I can find the cover of it. Uh, it's called, yeah, Grandeur, and this is really what Naples is all about. Hey, we've got super fancy real estate and very wealthy people come down and spend too much money, not just on your home, but on the hamburger you have to buy up the street. So, there you go. This car was featured in that as, uh, you know, I have no idea why. Honestly, I would have thought they'd be more interested in featuring some sort of fancy countertops, but this American Rambler got in there, so it charmed somebody. Uh, but that's the trunk, and other than the Continental kit being in your way, uh, it's a pretty good size. You could fit all kinds of in, and back in the 50s, you might have put infants in there. I mean, uh, you could put uh, toddlers, infants, you could have three or four of them in there. They don't even need to be strapped down, really, because it's got nice sort of that eh, soft material. It's not exactly what I'd call padded, but you know, if they hit it, they hit it. They'll probably be okay because the car doesn't go that fast. So uh, you can fit a lot of crap in there and it's what I would call a decent trunk. Uh, it may not have even come close to comparing with like a 57 Chevy of the era, but uh, it's probably better than any modern Bentley today. So, uh, you know, it was useful. And I'm sure a lot of women and old people drove these. They were popular with women because it was small small and maneuverable. I'm sure they were popular with old people because they were cheap. And for the same reason, they were popular with kids and young adults. Uh, again, because they were cheap, they could get into them. Uh, kids had a little added benefit on the interior, which we'll get into in a second. But let's have a look under the hood. So you pull this guy forward, which is pretty awkward. Push this down. Oh, God. And then lift this up. All right, and here it is. This is a very famous engine. This is called the Flying Scott, if I remember correctly. It's a six-cylinder, obviously 196 cubic inches. I want to say 3.2 liters. Uh, it's a flathead. Uh, it uses this weird tubular exhaust manifold. Very strange. Has no intake manifold of any kind that's obvious because it's actually under the uh, head bolts there. Uh, a single barrel Solex carb, uh, which, um, you know, appears to get the job done. And it's very simple and easy to maintain, which was going back to the point of this car. I mean, it's just a simple, simple car. Uh, there you see the 12-volt uh, um, uh, ignition, you know, going into a coil and points. And uh, this screw-on oil filter, which I believe that's what this is, was an option. I mean, everything was an option on this car uh, back then, like the cigarette, uh, independent auctions. Very interesting padding under the hood. Not sure if that's correct or not, but it, you know, looks fine and probably keeps things as they are. You've got this big battery coming up there, which I'm sure doesn't get too hot being next to the engine like that. Uh, it's got a trunnion-based front suspension with, you know, it's got coil springs and shocks, but uh, uh, goes into trunnions, which you have to keep lubed. Uh, the standard tranny the standard transmission was a Borg Warner 3 on the tree with an optional overdrive, and it was the smallest car in America to be offered with an automatic. You could get the Ford based AMC called it the Flash O Matic. God, I loved the names of shit back then. There's that angry, weird bird again. I see squirrels, but I don't see the bird. They're over there somewhere. 
Well, hopefully he stays up there. But anyway, so you could get an automatic in this thing, which this one has, called the Flashomatic, And uh, it actually shifts fairly well. It has no cooler, because apparently it doesn't need it. It's just air-cooled. And uh, yeah, it seems to do the job all right. And once again, if you maintain it, it apparently lasts a long time. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, going towards the back, it has uh, leaf springs with uh, shocks to keep things going. And uh, here's another unique and interesting feature of the car. I won't call it unique. But interesting, in 58, it was unibody design, uh, which, um, you know, was something of a curiosity at that point. So it was not body on frame. It was a welded unibody with subframes. And uh, that um, probably helped AMC keep costs down and, of course, would pave the way to being, you know, a lot of the stuff. Uh, worries about fuel economy, unibody design, smaller size, practical. Uh, this car was definitely ahead of its time and supposedly, that's why it sold so well. Uh, you know, they did owner surveys and, you know, like 70% of the people who drove it and owned it said, oh, I bought it because it handles, you know, they didn't want to say, look, I'm cheap. That's why I bought it, because I'm cheap. So they came up with handling, which, you know, the car handles like a golf cart, you know, with, with a lift kit. I mean, it does not handle in the modern sense very well at all. Uh, I think maybe what they mean, it was easy to park. It was easy to run around. You didn't have to worry about smashing into things. So maybe that's what they meant by handling. But that was one of the chief uh, joys at the time. Uh, but anyway, look, a very simple, very lovely drivetrain. No issues at all. You can see the condition of this one as a restoration is very, very nice. And one thing, again, I want to get back to, when I first saw this car sitting at Auto House, I did not realize how prevalent and prolific it was back in its day. I thought it was a bit of a curiosity, but no. I mean, they sold over 100,000 of them some years, so they were really, really popular cars. The reason you just don't see many today is that they were cheap throwaways. I mean, you know, once they died or, you know, went to the junkyards, they'd end up getting crushed. They'd get turned into razor blades. People didn't save them, uh, and that's why not that many are running around today, but there is a few and there's a lot of dedicated nuts out there keeping them going and you can still find some parts and some other stuff so as far as a classic car goes it's not that hard to own one of these things just like it wasn't back in the day when it was made so I'm going to pause there for a minute I'm going to get my shit together I'm going to set up a GoPro I'm still playing around with that and uh, then we're going to have a look inside see what's there that's an interesting bit and go for a spin so bear with me one moment all right, so let's have a look inside. You see, I got the GoPro set up now. I'm still not sure about these things, but eh, we'll give them a shot. In fact, let me get them started. Can you just press the record button and they start? No. You gotta, oh, yeah, well, I don't know. It, it is a recording. Yeah, it's recording. Uh, this one I can't reach now. Shit. Let's see. Hit that. Yeah, all right, so those things are going. We'll see what they produce, and let's have a look inside this thing. Okay, so back in Naples, I mean, Naples, back in the day in Naples, I mean, you know, we're going back decades now. There was, oh, God, I'm almost zoomed in. There was a bar called the Witch's Brew, and basically it was a cougar bar, and a young man could go into that bar at any given weekend and get molested and violated by a significantly older divorced woman wearing a, wearing a cat print pantsuit. And when I first looked inside and opened the door of this car, it just took me back to those <laughs> Witch's Brew days. Not that I took part in that sort of thing, but uh, it was there. And there is just, and I thought that there's no way this is a factory interior in this car. I mean, I know AMC was a little bit nuts, but I don't think they were this nuts. And uh, sure enough, when I read the article in that Grandeur magazine, it turned out that the very nice guy, by the way, the guy who restored this car uh, invented the disco floor that John Travolta danced on in Saturday Night Fever. That was his great claim to fame, which is a hell of a claim to fame, in my opinion. Uh, really really impressive so um Anyway, apparently in his restoration shop, he has a commercial sewing machine, and I think that's why we're seeing this uh, tiger paw 
cat print, but um, either way it's quite striking. Uh, the car is quite big inside. For a middle car, it's fairly big inside. You could fit three across in the front, three across in the back. Um, the seats, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to find a picture of it. They move forward and then fold down into a bed, almost like... Uh, what we I can't remember what little Italian car we had that did that so the Italians could go out and lunch and have some sort of a dirty lunch hour. Well, this was kind of the same and it must have been a big reason why it appealed to some of the younger buyers. You know, they could turn basically the interior into a full-size bed for their drive-in movie dates and uh, I'm sure that was something that they liked quite a bit. Uh, in the back, your Canadians are going to be pretty chipper with their cat print. Uh, they've even got little tiny arms rests the rear windows go down uh, because this is the custom model uh, sorry the super model uh, which added that luxurious feature and I almost think you could fit four Canadian side to side you could certainly fit three uh, but uh, I think you could have yeah, what a Canadian they'd squeeze five or six in there but realistically it's good enough for three people you see the wheel well infringing a little bit on your space but what the hell and uh, you have a decent sized package self to uh, put crap in <sighs> All right, what, the door panel, what can you say? It's a door panel. You have this little teeny tiny armrest, uh, which I don't think you'd have gotten on the base model. I think that was only on fancy ones like this. Uh, the steering wheel is quite large and thin, which is befitting a car with no power steering. And uh, what the hell, let's just jump in and go for a drive. Let's get this going. It's a couple, I can't believe it as an automatic. <laughs> Yeah, it fires right up, which, uh, again, was part of the longevity and reliability that people liked about these back in the day. Uh, it doesn't like being at low idle. Definitely revs up nice, but at low idle, it just feels a little bit shaky. Probably has tired engine mounts. Uh, like most 50s car, it has a painted dashboard. And we are talking absolutely no frills here. I mean, you've got one little bit of an instrument cluster display and I don't know how much money they save by not putting zeros after the numbers but uh, somehow they did so you've got one two I don't even are we going 30 or are we going three you know uh, you have a temp gauge you have a fuel gauge you've got two idiot lights no charge that's something that would have appealed to the cheap bastards who bought this car uh, low pressure probably on the oil little horn <laughs> trim ring there with a cheesy horn. Uh, this one is fancy enough to have self-canceling turn signals, so you can tell somebody spent some money on that. Uh, no radio, but it does have these big knobs to make your friends think it does have a radio. Uh, they may even try to tune it in, and you can just say, ah, there's no stations, but you know what I mean? What kind of ridiculous shit is this? Here's your, what is this? This is uh, the wipers. I hit those earlier by accident. Uh, those are your headlights here. Uh, you have this little, I haven't pulled it out yet. There it yeah, is. There's a little teeny tiny ashtray for little teeny tiny people with teeny tiny cigarettes. You got a chrome block off plate for something there. And then a bone of this must have cost a fortune on the option list. Uh, an actual cigarette lighter. And then a glove box that slides out and falls instantly to the ground. Like it's the tray underneath an oven or something. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. How do we get that back in? Goes. All right, so that's that's that famous Rambler build quality we were talking about. Uh, up here you have small sized fuzzy dice because the bigger ones look silly. Uh, you have a rear view mirror which appears to work. This one luxuriously enough has sun visors which pop out of its little tin pot thing there. Uh, here you see the mirrors. This one works fine over here. You can actually see it. Uh, the driver's side, it should be back here somewhere, not up there. I mean, you've got like this two inch window where if you move your head right, you can kind of see behind the car. But otherwise, just in casual looking, forget it. It's just not gonna happen. And then you've got the big R for uh, Rambler uh, there in the center, uh, what would be a horn button in a modern car. Uh, it also has the world's strangest shift indicator. So it's actually just this little addendum they've added onto the stick uh, that then goes over the letters and 
that way, that again also must have saved them some money. Uh, park at the top, reverse at the bottom, and uh, two, which I presume is drive, uh, right there. So. Uh, the Vista, interesting, bulbous round. You've got big fender humps on the left and right. You've got a hood hump in the middle and that knife edge shark fin um, uh, hood ornament sort of leading the way. Uh, no power steering, no power brakes. It's got drums front and back, same size. They're adequate, but a single pot master cylinder. So if that goes out, you're kind of fucked. And um, otherwise, it's just the height of simplicity. Uh, it just, you know, it just has, it, you know, later on, they had second, third generation Ramblers, they became muscle cars. In 69, the last third generation Rambler, you could even get a 390 V8 in one. It was like a Rambler SC or something. So these things did take part in the muscle car era and being small and light they would have worked well but um haven't had one of those yet All right, let's go for a spin it actually does have pretty good bottom end power which they say is inherent to that fine scott engine uh you know, that flash matic transmission shifts pretty well got three speeds and you know the thing will run 75 miles an hour which of course would have been you know approaching the um, speed limit back at the time although your gas mileage went to shit you know 40 50 you're probably turning in that close to 30 mile an hour figure you get up to 70 75 you were back in the teens but you know look it goes down the road fairly well um, again I the unibody construction the lightness of the car uh, it, this is, I guess, the handling that people liked. I mean, for the age, the car was pretty nimble. If you're wondering why the windshield looks fairly clean, it's because I did it myself, although I apparently missed a spot there. But, um, yeah, there you go. It was late at night. Dalton's windshield was shit. I had him wash the car for me, and I had to make it a little better so you'd be able to see something out of it. Here's our fancy, luxurious, self-canceling turn signals, which are almost certainly an option. Let's get out on the road and see what we got. And I mean, there's just not much you can say. I mean, obviously I have to have a test drive portion of the video, but <laughs> it just isn't all that exciting. But you know, the car steers well. I will say that this is pretty crappy acceleration right now. It felt a little peppier before I was doing the video. Uh, but now look, okay, so we're getting up there. I don't believe we're going 60, by the way. And I think this thing is turned off. So let's see, we won't be able to test our speed. But according to this, I'm going 60. And we're going 52, so yeah, we're close. We're close. All right, and you know, it's responsive enough. It's going down the road nice enough. And uh, what can I say? So look, I'm gonna let the GoPros do the rest of the work uh, and record as I drive. I'm not gonna sit here at this red light, which takes forever and bore everyone to tears. I would just point out again, this premier auction this week, uh, I'll put a link to it in there. There's 10 of our cars going through. We gotta get rid of them. If you want one, please God, bid on one, buy one so I can start over and do some new stuff. And uh, the, the RV project is actually coming together a little bit. I may do an updated video on that. Definitely gonna do one on the IROC project, which is coming together. And uh, what other, other cars I can put together and put in, we'll do a video on, so. Yeah, I almost forgot. This one is actually owned by Auto House of Naples, so I should put in a little plug for them. If you have an interest in this Rambler, uh, give them a call, 239-263-8500. Very good guys down there, and uh, then look after you. And this is a nice car, I have to say. Not for me, but you know, there's guys out there who would like this sort of thing, and if you do, uh, you're probably going to like this one. So, uh, once again, Auto House in Naples, autohousenaples.com, 239-263-8500. Take care.